So thank you very much, uh, Volker. And uh, I would like to uh, give my thanks also to Dr. Knecht for the invitation to be here at this very interesting meeting that we have again. So um, what I will try to do is um, to give you just some ideas about uh, new aspects in oropharyngeal uh, carcinoma. So um, as you see here, um, the uh, number uh, of patients with um, oral cavity and pharynx um, is around uh, 300,000 or a little bit more than 300,000 per year. And the interesting uh, aspect is that despite a decreasing occurrence of most tumors of the upper aerodigestic tract in developed countries, mostly because of the re reduction in smoking, the incidence of oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma is on the rise. And that's uh, an interesting uh, observation. So if we look at what the, um, the new findings are in the last five years, um, uh, after the uh, publication uh, um, of uh, Dr. Forestier in uh, the New England Journal, then um, you see that a new finding is the role of HPV as a risk factor um, in oral pharyngeal carcinoma. Novel therapeutic agents, uh, and one of the examples uh, of interest is the uh, anti-EGFR treatments. The expanding role of chemotherapy, and I just referred in that sense to the revival of induction chemotherapy. Um, the impact of altered fractionation schedules, uh, which in um, um, research institutes are being uh, promoted as very efficient, but in daily practice still by many of us is not being used. And um, also the introduction, of course, of IMRT. And new imaging techniques like, for instance, PET. And uh, last but not least, survivorship issues. So these are all important aspects, I think, when we're treating patients with had a neck cancer. Um, now, some of them are here uh, mentioned uh, with respect to oropharyngeal carcinoma. So, and I think the human papillomavirus and oropharyngeal cancer is, is at the moment um, getting a lot of attention. Um, I think one of the um, interesting observations um, in terms of epidemiology um, has been uh, found in the United States, and I, I got these uh, three slides that I'm going to show you from Dr. Gillison, um, who did a lot of work um, on the, in the field of uh, HPV and had a neck cancer. And as you see here, um, there was a report um, on the, the observations from the SEER program registries um, as you see, in a large uh, number of patients with um, squamous cell carcinoma of the oral cavity and oral pharynx. And these tumors were classified as potentially HPV related versus unrelated based on the primary site. And by doing so, they separated, as you see here, uh, tumors of the base of tongue, lingual and palatine tonsil. Uh, oropharynx and Waldaring ring uh, as HPV-related cancers, separating them from um, what they uh, called as HPV-unrelated cancers, that's tumors of the tongue, gum, floor of mouth, palate, and un other unspecified mouth. And what uh, was um, interesting is that what you see here, uh, the um, the line here, the upper line, is for HPV-unrelated tumors, and the lower one is for HPV-related tumors. And what you see is that there is a decrease in HPV-unrelated uh, tumors and a clear increase in HPV-related tumors that are coming together um, in 2004, as you see here. So that's, that's a, a very interesting uh, observation. Also, um, when you look at the survival figures, the two-year survival for HPV-related tumors versus HPV-unrelated tumors, 
then you see that over uh, the time frame from the 70s to 2004, the uh, two-year survival has not much changed in the HPV-unrelated tumors, but they are clearly um, increasing over time in the HPV-related tumors. So um, we had yesterday also a little bit of discussion about how things are changing in terms, are we seeing any benefit or not? And it's clear that in some categories of patients, there is a clear benefit uh, in outcome. Now, when we treat patients with a locally advanced disease, we, um, we assume, um, and I think that most of us accept, that there are three approaches uh, that are of importance. And uh, the first one is using surgery followed by adjuvant concurrent chemo radiation. Um, then the second one is definitive concurrent chemo radiation with surgery as an optional salvage or completion treatment. And um, the third one is also an, uh, a concept which is getting more and more attention again uh, that's induction chemotherapy followed by definitive local treatment. Now, over the uh, past years, um, as a result of individual trials, but in particular also uh, as a result of the um, meta-analysis that was performed by uh, Pignon and co-workers and published in The Lancet uh, two th uh, 2000, you see that the benefit um, of chemotherapy um, was at the time mainly uh, observed uh, with concomitant um, use of chemo uh, chemotherapy and radiation. So there was a risk reduction of 19% uh, and an absolute benefit of 8%. Um, in the new adjuvant setting, uh, that was initially not appreciated so much as you see here, but when they looked further on, um, on uh, the studies that used uh, Platinum 5-FU, there was an absolute benefit of 5%. Now, this study was updated uh, and reported by uh, Jean Boris in at ASCO 2004, and there was a, a very recent update in 2007 published. And what it showed was that if you look at the different categories, the different sites, then um, the um, best results have been observed, as you see here with oropharynx tumors and larynx tumors, um, when you uh, look for the role of concomitant chemoradiation versus uh, radiation alone, or any local form of treatment alone. Another aspect um, that recently was found of importance is the, um, the EGFR um, in this disease. And as we know that many of these tumors um, are express high levels of uh, EGFR, it is considered to be an EGFR-dependent tumor. And um, with a high expression, the outcome in general is uh, worse. And that has been shown uh, very clearly in patients that were um, candidates for surgery, where you see that um, those who have a high expression uh, do really worse than those who have a low expression. And also the interesting studies that um, uh, were performed by Dr. Ang in patients that were treated with radiation showed that the um, EGFR um, expression um, is of importance. Uh, those who have a high expression do seem to do less well uh, under radiation uh, than those who have uh, a low level. So it was of interesting then uh, to see what the use of uh, anti-EGFR treatment would do uh, in relation to radiation. And um, we are all aware of the study of um, Bonner et al., where a patient with locally advanced disease um, were treated with um, uh, radiation alone or a radi radiation with, uh, with cetuximab in the doses that we uh, usually use for this compound. And sh this showed that there was um, no difference in efficacy, as you see here, for um, um, the progression-free survival and overall su survival. There was, there was a benefit, there was a clear benefit for the arm with cetuximab, but no effect 
at all on the distant uh, metastasis. So the effect of adding um, cetuximab was mainly in the local regional area. And what was important, I think the second important uh, point from this study was that there did not seem to be an increase in, in mucositis. Um, now, we have seen, of course, um, information from uh, Dr. Budach in the New England Journal that some of the patients uh, have uh, shown severe toxicity and in a recent inquiry that was confirmed that some people um, uh, using this approach um, have been facing severe toxicities. But overall, in this trial, it was reported that the acute toxicity in terms of mucosal reactions was not um, enhanced by adding cetuximab, and also the late toxicity did not seem to be enhanced. However, if we look in the subgroup analysis, it was of interest to see that the effect with um, cetuximab uh, was clearly uh, evident in the patients with oral pharyngeal carcinoma, as you see here. Now, it's always difficult to make uh, a conclusion on subgroup analysis, um, but this was rather striking, and in some countries that has led also uh, to the um, advice to use this approach only uh, in these circumstances. Uh, also in, of interest was that um, when altered forms of um, radiation uh, was used, like twice daily administration or concomitant boost, boost, that um, the effect seemed to be um, more uh, evident in that subcategory of patients. Now, with the third uh, approach, induction chemotherapy, it would be of interest to see whether uh, patients with um, oral pharyngeal carcinoma uh, are also behaving differently, yes or no. And I think that um, um, uh, the trial that was reported by Dr. Forestier, and um, she allowed me to use the slides, and I got them from, from her, um, she presented that at ASCO. And this was a, a study in oropharynx and larynx tumors. Um, where patients were treated with induction chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation. The induction chemotherapy consisted of uh, paclitaxel and carboplatin. And then you see those who are responding to the induction chemotherapy received uh, chemoradiation, um, um, as you see here. And those who had stable disease or progressive disease stopped the treatment and went off protocol. Now, um, the outcome here was that if you look for um, um, HPV-positive tumors versus HPV-negative tumors, they were all negative in larynx cancer, but you see here that 61% um, uh, of the tumors with oropharyngeal carcinoma were HPV-positive, um, which was nearly in all cases HPV-16-positive. Now, these tumors um, that were HPV positive um, in general presented in regionally advanced uh, uh, disease stage and they were of the basaloid type. And when you look at the outcome, then one of the interesting observations was that the tumors that were HPV positive responded better to induction chemotherapy, as you see here, than those who have HPV negative tumors. And also, the, when we look at the progression-free survival and um, overall survival at two years, there was a significant difference in favor uh, of those who had HPV-positive tumors. Here you see the data for uh, oropharyngeal um, uh, cancers uh, only. So significant differences. And you see here the survival curves. Um, this is the overall survival curve for the HPV positive and HPV negative tumors. And here you see the progression free survival curves. Quite impressive, really. I think we don't know exactly how to interpret these data and, and how the relationship is between um, the presence of um, HPV um, and EGFR, for instance. And I think an interesting uh, paper that came out recently uh, was from a German group, as you see here. 
and they looked um, for the combined effect of um, of HPV, DNA, um, P16 protein, and